Tonight, on a special edition of Brian Ross Investigates, investigative journalist making a difference. The reporters who tracked down this surveillance tape revealing what happened in the back rooms of an Indiana police station, something the police chief described as a minor incident. And then jumped on top of him and punched him in the face repeatedly. The reporter in Alaska who discovered police in the state's remote villages who themselves had criminal records. One accused of raping this teenage girl. Who hired him? How come they let him work? Plus, the reporter who went undercover in a notorious for-profit prison to expose the chaos the public wasn't supposed to see. Since I've been here, it's been nothing but chaos. In Philadelphia, the reporters were their own undercover project, using teachers to test and expose dangerous conditions in the city schools. It was like a drug deal or something. And taking on President Trump on behalf of the New York Times. The New York Times is totally dishonest. He doesn't get a byline, but what he wrote in this letter made big news. From the Law and Crime Network studios in New York City's Herald Square, this is a special edition of Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening and welcome. Tonight we look at some of the great local investigative reporting that we've been highlighting this year, beginning with reporters in Indiana who took on what is always a tough assignment, police betraying their commitment to honesty and integrity. It was only after this video was finally made public that it became known what really happened to the suspect being dragged out of this police car and police officials and officers in Elkhart, Indiana, held to account. The man's name was Mario Guerra Ledesma, under arrest for domestic battery. So he was brought into a detention area at the police department. He was placed on a chair with his uh, hands cuffed behind his back. Reporter Christian Seckler of the South Bend Tribune had already been working on how the Elkhart, Indiana Police Department handled allegations of misconduct when he came across this case. At one point, he turned and began to spit towards one officer, that officer and another, and then jumped on top of him and punched him in the face repeatedly. But the police at first put out a much different version. Police Chief Ed Winbigler downplayed it to the Police Oversight Commission. And I think they just went a little overboard when they, when they took him to the ground. Without the video, the chief's version, a little overboard, became the official version. He made no mention of them throwing any punches, and really he just consistently downplayed what had really happened in the police station's detention area. Ken Armstrong is a reporter with the nonprofit group ProPublica, which has created a fund to help support local investigative journalism. Getting the video in Indiana made all the difference. You know, he's left on the ground bleeding afterwards for about six minutes. Then he's taken out on a stretcher. Um, you know, so this was not something where two officers simply went a little overboard. It, it went well beyond that. When the South Bend Tribune published the video, it also identified the two other officers in the room. And the two other officers included the mayor's son. Um, Sergeant Drew Neese. He was the only supervisor in the room. And the other officer in the room at the time the beating occurred was the head of the local fraternal order of police. And neither of those two officers stopped the beating as it occurred, but they walked over as it ends. And one of them says, stop. Stop! Oh, shit. And if Christian, and with your help, had not pushed for the video, what do you think would have happened? I don't think anything would have happened. You know, when the police chief reprimanded the two officers in June of 2018, he concluded his letter of reprimand with the line, I now consider this matter closed, with an exclamation point. But the Tribune reporting made it impossible to close the case. Top police officials blamed the newspaper for all its problems. Elkhart's assistant police chief Todd Thayer made an impassioned speech about his anger over the reports in the Tribune. Everything's going good in Elkhart. Why are they coming over here into our backyard and trying to disrupt everything that we built? Since then, the chief was forced to resign. The mayor has announced he will not run for re-election. And the two officers who actually threw the punches seen in the video they have been charged with misdemeanor battery and are awaiting trial. They have pleaded not guilty. I, I, it's the kind of local reporting that is so critical 
And it's the kind of local reporting that's suffering given the landscape and journalism these days. You know, so it's one of the things that ProPublica was hoping to address with the local reporting network to in some small way make up for that and, and to help bolster this kind of critical reporting um, in, in local newsrooms. It was a different kind of betrayal by police that an investigative reporter discovered in Alaska. Convicted felons who were able to get jobs as police officers in some of the state's remote villages, places where, until recently, few reporters ever showed up. Uh, my name is Kyle Hopkins. I'm a reporter and an editor for the Anchorage Daily News in Anchorage, Alaska. A lot of the uh, stories that we want to cover and a lot of the best stories are in these uh, far-flung villages that are hard, hard for us to get to. There are all these small communities with all these small governments and uh, they work um, you know, in, in the shadows. They just do they do what they like because there's there's no one paying attention because their communities just are not large enough to support a local journalist. I found that again and again you would see someone who had been accused of domestic violence or uh, even, you know rape or homicide, and uh, you would also find that that person had at one point and sometimes still was serving as the, as the village police officer. As Hopkins discovered when he traveled to this village above the Arctic Circle, the village of Selowick, population 850. On a November night three years ago, someone gave alcohol to 16-year-old Lois Cleveland and then raped her. She died that night, and while um, you know, the medical examiner called it uh, undetermined uh, reasons, um, you know, they, when, when Alaska State Troopers investigated, they found that she had um, handcuff marks on her wrists. And the state police soon determined that the village police officer who reported the crime, Brent Norton, was in fact the one who committed the crime. In an interview recorded by state police, Norton admitted he had given her liquor and had sex with her while she was unconscious. Did you do anything to her while she was passed out? Yeah, I did. What did you do? I thought she was on to be with me and I just it was not his first crime Hopkins discovered. You know, a simple background check showed that he already had been convicted of bootlegging and he was on probation for giving alcohol to another underage girl. So, um, you know, was had been, uh, you know, gone through the criminal justice system, was accused of and found to be guilty of a crime and was still on the job. The young victim's mother was distraught. We were supposed to be helping that furnishing and taking her taking her life or her childhood who hired him so come they let him work and then Hopkins set out in the state capitol to ask the officials in charge if there were other police officers like Norton convicted of serious crimes but still on the job and the response from this regulatory body, you know, and their job is to keep track of this stuff, was, you know, we have no idea. They just, they, they didn't know. They said no one knew. That led to a full-fledged effort by Hopkins and the Anchorage Daily News to find out why. It felt like it's a story that I had been missing and had been right in front of my face for years, and we had to finally, we just finally needed to address this. And he has. He is the recipient this year of a grant from the nonprofit ProPublica to continue his reporting as a kind of one-man wrecking ball against apathy and corruption. I uh, appreciate um, you know you, you putting a spotlight on um, on local reporting. It's uh, you know it, it's lonely. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lonely job. Nobody wants it out here. So um, so it's nice to uh, talk to somebody about it. In a follow-up report, Kyle Hopkins tells us he found that one in three Alaska communities have no police at all, and that incredibly, there are still sex offenders serving as police officers. Next, the reporter who put his life on the line to go undercover in a Louisiana prison when we return. Back now with our special edition, highlighting some of the great local investigative reporting that often does not get the attention it deserves. Like the reporter from Mother Jones who went undercover in a potentially very dangerous place inside a private for-profit prison 
a place that has worked hard to keep journalists and the public from knowing what is going on behind its walls. The assignment was to get hired as a guard inside this privately run prison known as the Wind Correctional Center in Winfield, Louisiana. Soon I'm going to be in there for eight hours a day, and then soon after that I'm going to be in there for 12 hours a day. Oh, God. This prison is crazy. Beyond anything I ever imagined. 1,500 inmates overseen by guards making $9 an hour. Mother Jones reporter Shane Bauer was quickly hired. On one of my first day of trainings, the head of training said to us uh, that um, at CCA will hire anybody. She said, you know, people, people say, say that we're scraping the bottom of the barrel, but we're not. But if you have a driver's license and are breathing and are willing to work, then we're willing to hire you. If you really care about yourself, you're supposed to protect yourself. Inside a place of chaos and violence, all captured on video by Bauer with a camera hidden in his watch that he smuggled inside. I was surprised with how uh, kind of bare bones the operation was. You know, there was very little staff. Uh, there were, you know, maybe uh, 25 guards for 1,500 prisoners, um, which kind of leads the prison to be more violent uh, than other prisons in the state. Um, <clears throat> there was uh, an escape while I was there in the middle of the day. And Bauer says the prison company cut corners on medical care for the prisoners. By actually my first day in the prison, I met a man who, prisoner who had lost his legs and fingers to gangrene. No sign up. Oh, Bauer says the company is slow to send anyone to an outside hospital because it has to pay the bill. If we want to act like refugees and animals, we're not acting like it. That's how we're being treated. Listen to what I'm saying. That's how we're being treated. What kind of pictures you got there? They're my pictures. What you took here don't belong to you. Bauer's cover was finally blown when a photographer from Mother Jones, James West, was spotted outside the prison taking exterior shots, and Sheriff's Department deputies demanded to see what was on his camera. All right, you can't take my camera off. I'm, right, I'm going to tell you one thing. Hand, 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 hand me that. I think the best thing to do is to seize this camera. And I think we'll so. get a search warrant and go. we'll look at them pictures. Okay. If you don't want to give it to me, I will take it. We found out later that someone at the sheriff's department had um, searched James's uh, video without a warrant. And on that video was an interview that he had done with me that day talking about working in the prison. So they were able to kind of connect that, uh, that I was. Uh, you know, a journalist. Bauer quickly moved out, calling in his resignation to the prison company. Um, I'm actually calling because I've decided to, to resign. Bauer's stories in Mother Jones and a subsequent book got the attention of the U.S. Department of Justice. And shortly afterwards, uh, the, the Obama administration uh, announced that they were going to um, stop using private prisons on the federal level. Um, <clears throat> this, of course, is reversed as soon as uh, Donald Trump became president. Um, so now it's kind of, you know, it's back to where it was before. All the more reason that Bauer's undercover reporting is now so important. Yeah, I mean, we've, we have a rich tradition of, of undercover journalism in this country, and it's only in the, in the last couple decades that uh, we haven't seen it as much. And I think that we have a right to see, you know, when companies are serving as public institutions, uh, what they are doing. And if they're not going to allow us access, then we have to figure out how to get it. In a statement, the company that ran the prison later called Shane Bauer's conduct reckless, but did not address in any way the appalling conditions Bauer discovered and documented inside the prison. Next, a shout out for the reporters in Philadelphia who carried out their own kind of undercover assignment that had huge impact on the lives and health of school children in their city. It was news that shocked the city. Dangerous levels of mold, lead, asbestos inside more than a dozen Philadelphia schools. All the result of a two year long project called Toxic City Sick Schools by the Philadelphia Inquirer and two enterprising reporters. I'm Wendy Ruderman. I'm a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I'm Barbara Laker. I'm a reporter also for the Philadelphia Inquirer. 
After the scandal of dangerous lead levels in the drinking water in Flint, Michigan, the two reporters wanted to know what the story was in Philadelphia. We wanted to take a look at Philadelphia's numbers and see if children in Philadelphia were being exposed to lead, and we learned that kids in Philadelphia were actually exposed to lead and had lead poisoning at far higher rates than in Flint, Michigan. And so they looked first at homes and landlords, then playgrounds, and finally schools. We were actually really shocked how um, bad the conditions were in the schools. But it took months of work to prove it, and a lot of stealth, finding teachers to conduct tests inside the school. Teachers were very reluctant. They were afraid of retribution from the school district. Um, but ultimately, we did get 26 teachers to help us do the testing in 19 of the most rundown schools. The reporters could not go into schools themselves to avoid being accused of trespassing. And it was all very hush-hush as the equipment and test results were passed back and forth. So it was almost like it was like a drug deal or something. It was kind of funny and crazy. <laughs> but they would hand us these little vials filled with um, dust wipes, and then we would take them over to the lab. The results made headlines. Investigation teachers at a Philadelphia K through eight school have just about had it. And students at one of the schools even wrote letters to local officials. We need funding for a better school. It's like the school is falling apart. Dear State Senator Vincent Hughes, every day I go to school, I feel like I'm in a prison or a junkyard. The school can probably break down anytime soon. Our doors are broken, broken computers and leaking heaters. We had um, one little boy, uh, Dean Pagan, who was a first grader in a school, and he was um, sitting at his desk trying to learn, and there was a ton of lead paint on the ceiling above his desk and it fell on his desk and on the floor beside his desk and he was scared that he'd get in trouble having a messy desk and he thought he'd also um, the teacher would be mad at him if he got up to put it in the trash can so he ate the lead paint chips on his desk and he ended up having a lead level of like 46 which is I mean, off the charts high. He was hospitalized for three days and nights. And he was left, the reporters say, with serious learning disabilities. This afternoon, the mayor and other city leaders visited a middle school. The story finally got the attention of school officials, who at first had been highly critical of the reporters' efforts. The testing methodology that was employed by the reporters, we have already come out and been very clear that we don't agree with that. But under public pressure, the schools launched a massive $15 million cleanup campaign at the seven schools named by the Philadelphia Inquirer as having the worst conditions. But that sort of raises questions about all the schools that we didn't get into and we couldn't get teachers to test or we just, you know, it's just, it's just so vast. It was a big commitment from our newsroom and it involved pretty much the whole staff and yes, my, um, myself and Barbara and Dylan Purcell who helped us do a lot of the data uh, analysis of uh, maintenance logs. So ultimately our job is to expose something that's wrong and shed light on it and then empower people with knowledge and then on top of that empower the community to actually pick up the ball and have conversations that make change and that's what's happening here in Philly. Coming up next on our special edition, a shout out for someone who never had a byline in his newspaper, but whose writing has made a very big difference. Finally tonight, a shout out for someone who works at the New York Times, but doesn't get a byline. Even so, it was what he wrote in response to President Trump's attacks on the New York Times that made a lot of news. My name is David McCroft. I am the Deputy General Counsel at the New York Times Company, and my primary responsibility is anything that comes out of the newsroom that presents a legal problem. David McCraw has never won a Pulitzer Prize or even had a New York Times byline, but I told him that in newsrooms around the country, he is seen as a hero in an era of journalism under attack. I'm not sure I'm going to buy into the hero label, but certainly I've had a platform to stand up for journalism, and I'm proud to do that. It has put him head to head with Donald Trump. To. The New York Times is totally dishonest, totally dishonest. I think the main thing that concerns me has been the attempt by the president and others to delegitimize the press. 
really is an invitation to distrust, to not believe. You are fake news. You are the enemy of the people. You look at the networks, you look at the news, you look at the newscasts, I call it fake news. I draw a line between that and criticism of the press. The press should be criticized, any institution should. But this idea of just to dismiss it as fake news, enemy of the people, I think has been deadly. Do you think Donald Trump believes that? I think he knows that it plays well to a political base. I don't know whether he really thinks that is a true fact. And the New York Times is failing. If I weren't here, I believe the New York Times probably wouldn't even exist. When he continues to refer to the Times as the failing New York Times, what's the reaction inside this building? It's, it's a little amusing because, as you know, he also talks about how he saved the New York Times because subscriptions went through the roof when he was elected, and that's really closer to the truth. In his new book, Truth in Our Times, McCraw recalls perhaps his finest hour as he came to the defense of a New York Times report about two women who claimed Trump had physically groped them. He was like an octopus. It was like he had six arms. He was all over the place. Trump, then a candidate, angrily denied the allegation. Now we address the slander and libels that was just last night thrown at me by the Clinton machine and the New York Times and other media outlets as part of a concerted, coordinated, and vicious attack. And overnight, Trump's lawyer demanded the Times retract its story and issue an apology, saying, quote, failure to do so will leave my client with no option but to pursue all available actions and remedies. I felt that we needed to have a strong response. The response was this letter from McCraw, no retraction, essentially, see you in court. We did what the law allows. We published newsworthy information about a subject of deep public concern. If Mr. Trump disagrees, if he believes that American citizens had no right to hear what these women had to say, and the law of this country forces us and those who would dare to criticize him to stand silent or be punished, we welcome the opportunity to have a court set him straight. The letter went viral. In the end, I think the people at the Times were very happy <laughs> that I'd done it this way. Um, and I'm fortunate to work in a company that was going to stand behind me for a response this strong. That's our program for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here next week. Good night.